No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America. Episode 5, The Trip and The Product. At the same moment, a K-line container filled with cheap shirts from Honduras enters the Hobart rail yard. Ice knocks down a door in Southgate and deports an entire family back to Tegucigalpa. To the south, the intermodal trains heading towards El Norte are alternately called La Bestia or El Tren de la Muerte. We think these names are apt. Commodity capital crosses into Southern California unscathed, but the fortunate family members and loved ones that survive harrowing journeys aboard the roofs of these trains for sometimes thousands of miles must disembark, barred entry into the very same country that willingly accepts the commodities that some of the very same migrants produced with their own sweat and blood back in Central America. How to Stop a Wound from Bleeding, L.A. Onda. The Trip Based on my own experiences and my discussions with countless travelers, permit me to hazard a rough overview of the journey from south to north. The trip to the border plays out very differently, depending on how much money a person has and whether the person is Mexican or Central American. Let's start with Central Americans. Citizens of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua can circulate freely inside of these four countries, the CA4. So Salvadorans and Hondurans can travel through Guatemala to the Mexican border without any particular issues other than paying for transportation. The Mexican border, however, is another matter entirely. Citizens of the CA4 cannot just walk up to the Mexican border and cross it without issue, nor can they circulate inside of Mexico without risk of deportation if they do not have the relevant visa. There are legal means for Central Americans to enter and pass through Mexico on the way to the United States, all of which come at a price, essentially a series of bribes, that some can pay and others cannot. I will start by describing what people do when they cannot enter Mexico legally. Mexico's heavily forested southern border is well policed, but it is relatively porous, and the authorities policing it are fantastically corrupt. Central Americans have several options for crossing it, and then crossing Mexico itself. The worst and most deservedly notorious way to get to the United States is via La Bestia, or The Beast, the Mexican freight trains. I have heard an astonishing array of horror stories about this trip. It's fair to say that for many people, crossing Mexico is an even more harrowing ordeal than crossing the border into the United States. There are two main train lines running from southern Mexico into La Lecheria, the main transfer point in Mexico City for all traffic coming from the south and going north. One of these lines starts in the city of Tenosique in Tabasco, and the other in Arriaga in Chiapas. So Central Americans who cannot afford any other option have to cross the Mexican border on foot and walk to one of these cities, no small distance. Every step of the way, they run the risk of robbery, rape, kidnapping, assault, extortion, deportation, arrest, and murder at the hands of the police, the military, any number of different gangs and cartels, and God knows who else. They also risk exhaustion and exposure. Common departure points in Guatemala include parts of the provinces of San Marcos and Huehuetenango, en route to Arriaga, and parts of the Parque Nacional Sierra del Lacandon and Parque Nacional Laguna del Tigre in the northern Petén, en route to Tenosique. There are shelters and solidarity projects in both cities, the most prominent being La Setenta y Dos in Tenosique. From either location, it is finally possible to get on a northbound train. Running the gauntlet across Mexico on La Bestia may be the most deadly method of travel in the entire Western Hemisphere. All of the above risks are magnified on the trains, along with the danger of death and dismemberment from falling off the freight cars, which are often incredibly overcrowded. There are other shelters and solidarity projects along both rail lines, as well as in Mexico City and around La Lecheria itself. These projects range from established campaigns to the daily efforts of individuals and families that live along the tracks and toss food and water onto the trains as they roll by. 
Once again, there are two main ways to go north from La Lecheria, both fraught with all the perils described above, including an ever-increasing risk of arrest and deportation as one proceeds further north. The first route, toward the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas, proceeds up to San Luis Potosí and then to Nuevo Laredo, or Reynosa, in Tamaulipas. The second, toward the southern Arizona desert, is through Guadalajara, and then up the Pacific coast to Altar or Caborca in Sonora. These are probably the two most important destination points for migrants and refugees along the entire border, Reynosa and Altar. Both routes have advantages and disadvantages. The problem is that ultimately, both options are terrible. The advantages of the northeastern route to Reynosa are that it is a much shorter trip on the train and that the terrain is somewhat less deadly on the American side. It is also closer to the eastern and midwestern parts of the United States. The disadvantage is that most of this territory is controlled by the Zetas cartel. This route is notorious for the first San Fernando massacre of 2010, in which the Zetas murdered 72 Central American migrants and refugees in the municipality of San Fernando, just south of Matamoros in Tamaulipas, and then the second San Fernando massacre of April 2011, in which the Zetas hijacked numerous passenger buses on Mexican Federal Highway 101 in the same small town, kidnapping, torturing, and murdering 193 people. In southern Arizona, we saw a surge in the numbers of Central Americans crossing the desert that lasted for about two years after the San Fernando massacres, as thousands of people understandably decided that the northeastern route wasn't worth the risk. The advantage of the northwestern route to Altar is that this territory is controlled lock, stock, and barrel by the Sinaloa cartel, who have a reputation for being more business-like, if nothing else. It is also closer to the western parts of the United States. The disadvantages are that it is a much longer trip on the train, and it means crossing the border into the Sonoran Desert in southern Arizona, which has been swallowing people alive by the thousands. Backing up, there are also many Central Americans who don't have to take the train. Central Americans who can afford to do so can pay through the cartel system to arrange for any combination of a guide through the Mexican border, a passage through Mexico to the American border, most commonly to Reynosa or Altar, although there are other destinations, notably Sonoita and Mexicali, and a guide through the American border to the other side. The disadvantage to this approach is that it can cost upwards of $10,000 with no guarantee of success. Not everyone has this money, and it represents a major expenditure to nearly all who do. It also means putting one's life completely in the hands of the cartel system, which entails real dangers of kidnapping, extortion, rape, and so on. Nevertheless, such arrangements are very common. Then there is the possibility of risking the buses in Mexico. I have met people who did this successfully, or were able to bribe their way out of trouble when discovered. The problem is that the Mexican immigration authorities inspect northbound buses at points throughout Mexico, especially near the Guatemalan and American borders. Even I can usually tell Mexicans and Central Americans apart by overhearing a snippet of conversation, and the Mexican authorities are famously adept at this. Without even checking for papers, they can usually trip up most people with a couple of questions and demands, such as, how much do you weigh? Guatemalans think in pounds, Mexicans in kilograms, or... Recite for me the Grito de Dolores. Virtually all Mexicans can do so, just as virtually anyone who grew up in the United States could rattle off the Pledge of Allegiance if forced to, whereas most people who grew up elsewhere could not, or through any number of other tricks. People who look indigenous invariably attract more attention. If discovered on buses, the risk of abuse at the hands of authorities is tremendous. Next, Sometimes Central Americans can get the papers needed to cross Mexico legally. This involves jumping through numerous bureaucratic hoops, all of which are designed to separate travelers from as much money as possible, and all of which are applied in a way that systematically disfavors indigenous people. That said, there are occasions when the Mexican authorities seem to throw up their hands and essentially say, to hell with it, here are your papers, get through here as quickly as possible, and you're the American's problem. This was happening especially frequently for a period from late 2013 to early 2014, around the time that the American press started reporting on the Central American unaccompanied minors crisis 
It's not impossible for Central Americans to get papers to enter the United States legally, but the process is exceptionally onerous. For context, any American citizen can enter Guatemala free of charge without a visa. U.S. citizens can stay in the CA-4 for 90 days and then must leave for two days by crossing the border into Chiapas, Belize, or Costa Rica before returning for another 90 days. This can be repeated forever. There are American expats around Lake Atitlan who have been doing it for decades. While it is theoretically possible for an American to be turned back by a Guatemalan immigration, I have only ever heard of this happening to people who got involved in Guatemalan politics, or to people who failed to obey the 92 rule. Otherwise, even axe murderers are welcome. For a Guatemalan to apply for a visa to visit the United States, the fee is $160, paid to the American government. This fee is not returned if the visa is denied, but the Guatemalan is welcome to try and to pay again. Applying for the visa means first getting a passport, which costs $160, paid to the Guatemalan government. Without fail, this must be accompanied by a bribe, paid to someone at the passport office. The bribe has to be larger if the Guatemalan is indigenous, probably about $160 more. The visa application must be filled out online and in English. It is also timed. It probably goes without saying that most Guatemalans do not simultaneously have $500 to burn, speedy internet access, and the ability to fill out a form in English. There is a cottage industry of people who fill out these forms for a hefty fee. Despite all this, every business day at the American Embassy in Guatemala City, up to a thousand people wait in line for a hearing with a consular official. The hearing lasts three to five minutes. The most important thing is to demonstrate binding economic ties to Guatemala, chiefly property ownership. If the visa is granted, it does not give the Guatemalan permission to enter the United States. It gives permission to present oneself legally at an American port of entry. The final decision is then made by the Customs and Border Protection agent working the port. This agent can deny the Guatemalan entry without cause, and there is no legal redress if they choose to do so. The process is especially onerous for other Central Americans, somewhat less so for Mexicans. Only a very dense person would miss the point that this system is rigged to filter out poor people. To wrap this up, Mexicans can travel freely in Mexico without any particular issue other than paying for transportation. That said, many of the poorest Mexicans also ride the trains, on which they are subject to all the same dangers and hardships as Central Americans, aside from the threat of deportation. Most other Mexicans traveling to the United States ride buses to Altar, Reynosa, or one of the other well-known departure points along the border. Towards the end of 2013, we started getting calls from bus stations in Arizona, asking us to help them assist Central American women and minors who had been dropped off by Border Patrol. These women and children all had basically the same story to tell. They had been apprehended in the desert, detained, processed, given notices to appear in immigration court some months ahead, driven to the bus station, and told to be on their way. This was, quote-unquote, the unaccompanied minors crisis. This is not normal behavior on the part of Border Patrol by a long shot. For years, we had strongly condemned Border Patrol for their practice of depositing Central Americans directly across the border on the Mexican side. This sort of third-party delegation is illegal, and in the case of minors, constitutes child endangerment under American law. More importantly, it exposes people to extreme danger. As a humanitarian and an opponent of all borders on principle, I will say that this sudden change in U.S. Border Patrol policy was a step in the right direction, and even that it undoubtedly saved some lives. Needless to say, though, word got around about this, and large number of Central American miners started heading north, both with and without their mothers. Meanwhile, in Mexico in early 2014, I saw firsthand that the Mexican authorities on the Guatemalan border were issuing seven-day transmigration forms to Central Americans in mass including to busloads of single men. This was not normal behavior on the part of these authorities either. When we started meeting many of these people in southern Arizona, it turned out that a great many of them were indigenous mom speakers from the provinces of San Marcos and Jejetenango in Guatemala, which are well known as areas of resource extraction. Then we started hearing different versions of a similar story, 
The cartels were trying to clear out parts of San Marcos and Getenango along the Chiapas border in order to use the territory for drug smuggling, human trafficking, and mining. I can't empirically prove this, and I'm not sure which tail is wagging which dog, but based on a large amount of anecdotal evidence, I feel confident that something fairly scandalous was happening. If this is true, it had to involve a coordination of policy on some level by the American, Mexican, and Guatemalan governments, by the major cartels, and by various mining companies, most likely Canadian. The period ended later in 2014, after the quote-unquote crisis briefly became major news and the Border Patrol stopped releasing Central American minors and women with underage children. The Obama administration later deported many of the women and children who entered the country during this time, and the Trump administration will undoubtedly attempt to deport most of the rest. Was this widely publicized crisis the result of a sincere effort to manage the border more compassionately? Was it a cold-blooded displacement strategy that directly benefited corporate, governmental, and criminal elites of four countries? Or was it both at once? I have no way to be certain. My guess is a little of the former and a lot of the latter. I wish an actual investigative journalist had tried to pin down what was happening. In fact, no one in any sector of the press put these pieces together. Regardless, the episode illustrates one of my central themes. The regulation of human movement, according to place of birth, cannot be made just. Even well-intentioned attempts to enact humane border policies will have unforeseen and probably undesirable consequences. The Product It is not possible to understand what happens next in the process of crossing the border without a lengthy tangent on the subject of marijuana. Capital. One of the strongest arguments in favor of the legalization of street drugs in the United States is that it would take some of the oxygen out of the Mexican drug war. There are many other good arguments, but that's not my focus here. This much is true. However, to understand the likely consequences of legalization, it's necessary to understand the North American drug market. It's particularly important to understand the marijuana market, since it's unlikely that other street drugs will be legalized anytime soon. Most high-grade marijuana consumed in the United States is grown domestically, especially in Northern California. The industry is highly decentralized. There are thousands of independent operations in California and in many other states. Most low-grade marijuana consumed in the United States is grown in Mexico. In parts of Baja California and the Sierra Madre Occidental, controlled by the Sinaloa cartel. The industry is highly centralized. There is only one game in town. The two industries have traditionally occupied separate market niches. Small to mid-scale marijuana cultivation is legal, semi-legal, or tolerated in some parts of the United States. However, there is nowhere that it is possible to grow marijuana on the scale on which it is grown in Mexico. Even after marking up the price to move the product across the border, Sinaloa can still undersell American growers when dealing in bulk. Exporting the product means compacting it, though, which degrades the quality. So, traditionally, Sinaloa has dealt with larger quantities of lower-quality product, and American growers have dealt with smaller quantities of higher-quality product. This has begun to change. As legalization efforts in the United States have progressed, marijuana prices have dropped across the board. Sinaloa is still hanging on to its market share, but if it becomes possible to grow marijuana on an industrial scale in the United States, or even on a slightly larger scale than it is now, American growers will be able to cut Sinaloa out of the market. The obvious endgame of this is that a heavily subsidized American agribusiness company, probably a tobacco company, would export marijuana to Mexico, dominating that market as well, as Mexican growers could not hope to compete on such a scale. Wait, where have we heard this before? It is tempting to say, good, and leave it at that. Sinaloa is not a benign organization. However, Cutting it out of the American marijuana market will have unpleasant consequences. I respect some aspects of the marijuana legalization movement, but single-issue activists are deluding themselves if they think that legalization will only bring positive results. Here is why.
As I described above, the two main camps in the Mexican drug war are organized under different business models and use different marketing strategies. Sinaloa's camp controls the major migration and marijuana smuggling routes along the border. It controls territory where marijuana and poppies are grown, so it can produce its own marijuana and heroin, along with every kind of drug that can be manufactured in a lab. It distributes every kind of drug in existence, both for domestic consumption and for export to the United States. Compared to the Zetas camp, it profits more from these activities and less from extortion, kidnapping, and contract killing. The Zetas do not control major migration or marijuana smuggling routes across the border. They do not control territory where marijuana or poppies are grown, so they cannot produce their own marijuana or heroin. They do produce every kind of drug that can be made in a lab. They distribute every kind of drug in existence, both for domestic consumption and for export to the United States, except for marijuana. The Zetas are not major players in the American marijuana market. It would make no sense. They could only buy from their competitors, and they could never sell as cheaply. They must import heroin for distribution, usually from Afghanistan. Compared to Sinaloa, they profit more from extortion, kidnapping, and murder for hire. Of all of these activities, the only one that necessitates upholding one end of a social contract is the cultivation of marijuana and poppies. To grow crops, Sinaloa must deal with the campesinos that work the fields. Sinaloa demands obedience, and in return, it promises to protect and care for its people. In this way, it is no different from any other government. Effectively, it is the government. In the territory that Sinaloa governs, it largely upholds its end of the bargain. Sinaloa has an interest in social stability. The Zetas have an interest in social instability. For all of these reasons, marijuana legalization affects Sinaloa more than the Zetas. However, the drop in prices is not hurting Sinaloa's bottom line. The organization is robust. It has a diverse portfolio and various contingency plans. At the moment, it also has to uphold its end of the social contract. So, the drop in marijuana prices has led Sinaloa to shift production to poppies in the Sierra Madre Occidental. This led first to a drop in heroin prices in the United States, and then to a spike in demand, and then to a dramatic increase in heroin overdoses nationwide. This is the origin of the heroin epidemic that the American press began to report on in 2014. Even if the Mexican marijuana industry collapses completely, it will probably not cost Sinaloa one cent. Sinaloa will increase heroin production until there is no more room to grow poppies, or until the American market is so saturated that it can absorb no more production. Given the nature of heroin, this might be hard to do. If marijuana collapsed and heroin simultaneously reached saturation, then some part of Sinaloa's agrarian base would become expendable and would be abandoned. Sinaloa would then fall back on cocaine and lab drugs, but most likely there would eventually be some breakdown in distribution or logistics. Only after all of this happens would the legalization of marijuana actually begin to cost Sinaloa money. If Sinaloa starts to lose money, that distinctly favors the Zetas. This is not what most marijuana legalization activists are hoping for. At the moment, marijuana is a special case. An actual end to drug prohibition in the United States is not in the cards. However, social attitudes are changing, and it's worth speculating about what effects the end of prohibition would have in Mexico. An end to prohibition would spell trouble for all the cartels. Prices would drop, which would cause a spike in demand, which would call for more supply. Eventually, the market would be glutted to the point that profits would diminish, and the only solution would be to rely on an economy of scale to reduce costs. This has already happened with marijuana. Faced with diminishing profits, the cartels would not just ride off into the sunset. They would look for other sources of revenue, such as extortion, kidnapping, and contract killing. Failing all of this, if the cartels did go under, the lower-ranking members would be thrown out of work first. It would move up the food chain and affect the biggest fish last. The cartels are employers. Like it or not, they provide a source of income to many people. Simply putting them out of business would leave large numbers of people with no clear means of subsistence. To be precise, it would do that unless it was accompanied by a wider social transformation that enabled them to pursue another way of life. So what am I advocating? I'm not dismissing activists' efforts to decriminalize the use and sale of marijuana. It's a step in the right direction, and it has helped shift the grounds of the debate. But let there be no illusions. Marijuana legalization, minus an end to drug prohibition, 
will bring a new set of problems. And barring broader social change, the end of drug prohibition would bring another. Labor. Most hard drugs are smuggled into the United States in vehicles, through every official port of entry along the entire border. As often as not, this is accomplished with the assistance of corrupt Custom and Border Protection agents working the ports. All that the agent needs to know is what vehicle to look for so as to wave it through instead of stopping it, and the job is done. Much of the Mexican drug war boils down to conflict over who controls these ports of entry. Marijuana is different. Being cheap, bulky, and fragrant, it is mostly carried through the desert on foot. This is accomplished by groups of burros, donkeys, who carry the 50-pound bales of highly compacted marijuana on their backs. This is not an easy task. The desert consumes these people just as readily as migrants and refugees, and to the mafias that employ them, they are indeed as expendable as donkeys. There are two basic kinds of marijuana smugglers. The first, mostly from northern Sonora, are those who do it for a living. They might start working when they are barely teenagers, and some of them know the desert better than any Border Patrol agent, even better than I do. They are paid about as well as public school teachers in the United States, which is to say much better than employees in any other line of work available to most young men from northern Sonora. It's a job. The second, mostly from Central America, are those who do it one time. These people are in fact migrants or refugees. Instead of paying the mafia thousands of dollars to get into the United States, they pay for their passage by carrying a bale. The bale might be worth $100,000. The borough takes all the risk and gets paid nothing. But for Central Americans with little or no money, it's the best deal in town. Sometimes this risk is not freely chosen, either. It's not unheard of for travelers, usually Central American, to be kidnapped at the border and press-ganged into service. Those who transport marijuana for a living can often be found in groups with those who are doing it just once. It's common for a group to consist of six to eight Hondurans who carry the weight and one or two Sonorans to lead the way. When spoken to like human beings, these people tend to be as quick as anyone else to tell their side of the story. It often sounds a lot like this. Border Patrol apprehends a group. One of three things happen. Sometimes they confiscate the marijuana, then detain and prosecute the group for drug smuggling. There are Border Patrol agents who are not in on the game. Besides, it wouldn't look right if no marijuana ever showed up in court. Other times, they confiscate the marijuana, then detain and deport the group as migrants. In this case, the marijuana never shows up in court. Is the borough going to say anything to the judge? No. And still other times, they confiscate the marijuana and just leave the group in the desert to walk back to Mexico. I've heard this all over and over again. Multiple unconnected people are not making up the same story. What could be happening? Onto whom could these agents be unloading all of this marijuana? Who can possibly deal with 500 pounds at once? There is only one answer. Sinaloa. Burrows in their loads are traded as favors, passed around in complex horse trading between law enforcement and organized crime. The mafia understands that agents on the take have to keep up appearances and that a percentage of the product will be lost. Agents on the take understand that the mafia has to move enough product to keep the wheels turning and that it's not in anyone's interest to actually shut the sector down. Everybody wins, except for the kid from Honduras who has to sit in prison when it's his turn to take the fall. Once, a Sonoran teenager asked me how much Border Patrol agents in the field get paid. I told him that a normal salary was about $70,000. He thought that was hilarious. They can get more than double that any time they feel like taking one of our loads. They only have to do it once or twice a year and they're set. We do all the hard work for them. Government bodies sometimes claim that solidarity workers such as ourselves are aiding and abetting drug traffickers. This is the height of irony and hypocrisy. Elements of Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection are engaged in drug trafficking on an industrial scale. This is not an accusation. It is a statement of fact. Any but the greenest BP or CPB agent knows it's true. If anyone within these agencies is actually interested in fighting a war on drugs, they should start by cleaning their own house. And for the record, no, I've never seen a bail. The entire job description of a borough is to make sure that doesn't happen. 
I don't think anyone deserves to die in the desert for carrying marijuana. And I have no legal obligation to ask a starved and dehydrated person what he does for a living before I give him food or water. Also, if Americans don't like marijuana smugglers, they shouldn't smoke so much marijuana. I don't smoke any myself. Just listen to episode 5 of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America, published by the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for episode 6, The Border. This audiobook is a production of the X Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, or to learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders, visit crimethink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org. Thank you.